Today on What It's Like, I give you the quirkiest car that ever existed, 1964 Amplicar 770, the car that swam. But before getting into all of it, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like. If you just stumbled upon this channel for the very first time, you've hit the jackpot. We cover the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars. Those are car brands that no longer exist. We dive in deep with the specs, period ads. This channel is so much more than walking around a car with music. If that sounds like a channel that you would totally dig, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. This rare 1964 Amplicar Model 770 is currently for sale at Classic Auto Mall. What's Classic Auto Mall? The largest automotive consignment dealership northeastern region of the United States with over 870 cars for sale when recording this episode. For more information, pricing, and pictures of this very car, click the link below after the show. Amphicar was produced from 1960 to 1965 with model years ranging from 61 to 68, manufactured by the Quant Group, designed by Hans Tripel. And it's important to note that this wasn't the first amphibious vehicle produced. Both sides during World War II had amphibious vehicles. The U.S. with the DUKW, Ford GPA, UK with DD Tank and Terrapin, Japan with the Type 4 KATSU, and Germany with the Volkswagen Schwimmwagen. It's important to note the Amphicar wasn't Hans Tripel's first amphibious car attempt back in 1935. So before the World War II amphibious vehicles even came on the scene, he made a prototype designed for the civilian market called the SG6. It was a streamlined tub body. Only 20 versions of the SG6 were made. Interesting side note, Tripel used Bugatti's plant in Molsheim to produce the SG641 during the war. The Amphilcar is the direct descendant of the SG6. Production of the Amphilcar started late 1960 and all of the cars were done being produced by 1963. The plan was to sell around 20,000 units annually. Well, unfortunately, that didn't happen. I mean, this car was a stellar idea. Think about it, the person that is always running late. If you see a river, you no longer have to drive 20 miles out of the way to find a bridge to cross the river. You could drive across the river in your car. How cool is that? Between the years 1963 and 1965, the cars were being assembled. And much like the Duesenberg, they were titled for the year that they were sold. Interesting that 1968 was the last year the Amplicar was sold in the USA due to environmental emissions and safety regulation standards. Besides, it was probably only a matter of time before the insurance companies would have killed it too because they were killing everything around this time period. Called the Model 770 for seven knots in the water and 70 miles per hour on land. Interesting tidbit, the Amphilcar Model 770 was launched at the 1961 New York City Auto Show. Really funny story, so Lyndon B. Johnson, who was the 36th president of the United States had one of these and he liked to frighten his visitors at his John City, Texas ranch by driving downhill in his Amphilcar yelling, I can't stop before driving into the lake. Everybody would be so confused whenever they saw him just floating there on the water in his Amphilcar. Let's talk specs. 171 inches long, 61 inches wide, 60 inches tall. It rides a wheelbase of 82.7 inches. It weighs 2,300 pounds, price $3,400, which is equivalent to you spending $32,551 in the year 2023. Total production. This is the total production for the entire run, 3,878 units, of which 97 of those were right-hand drive. Out of the 3,878 produced, only 400 are known to exist today. Moving on to engines. So there was only one engine on offer, and this is very interesting. This is the same engine that was used in the Triumph Herald on Top Gear BBC. They did an episode of Amphicars, and James May drove a Triumph Herald, which that was a really cool connection that the Top Gear production company did 
by making a Triumph Herald the amphibious car because their engine powered a real amphibious car. Anyway, 1147cc inline four cylinder, 1.1 liters. It's good for 43 horsepower at 4750 RPM. 61 pound feet of torque at 2250 RPM. Bore of 2.7 inches, stroke of three inches, compression eight to one, backed by a four speed manual. Zero to 60, 21.7 seconds. Theoretical top speed, 70 miles per hour on land, seven knots in the water, or roughly about 10 miles per hour in the water. Average fuel economy could be anywhere between 29 and 30 miles to the gallon. I saw as high as 32 miles to the gallon. All right, let's talk styling. So check out this. Look at this chrome piece, how it comes up around and then continues. Notice it doesn't go all the way down. It stops right here and goes across. Notice this comes to a point like a boat. These protrude out like Dagmars. See how this comes to a spear here. Also notice the wheel position. It's not a very big wheelbase. This wheel sits further back in and that wheel's pushed in too. Literally, the wheels are just a little bit bigger than the door. Also check out the position of how high the door is. There's a nice fin section here. Just look at how pointy that fin is. So there's a lot going on with this hood section. There's a light, more lights here. These open. has one mirror which is mounted on the front fender notice it's a convertible the engines in the trunk that's why this is all finned out so here's the exhaust backup lights I love this tail section, how the fin comes back here. Look, it's got propellers. Coming up and getting inside. So just check out this door panel. Feels like a vinyl material. There's a nice matte pocket there. This is the door handle to get out. This is the window crank for the big window. Operates like that. Another lever down here, and that is to lock the door. So that's very interesting. Fent window here. And let's just look at how that's designed. Coming down inside the pedal box down here. Notice the pedals are all the way kind of sort of pushed over to the center. Clutch, brake, gas pedal, high beam switch there. This is for the gear selector. I'm assuming that... Let's 
seats can be movable by this adjustment lever here. Notice how far down this sits. Just take a look at this interior. I love the red and white. Here's what over the hood looks like. Here's what first person over the hood looks like. Here is under the steering wheel situation. There is adequate room. There's enough room to put my fingers underneath the steering wheel. On to the button switches and knobs, starting at the top left and moving right, starboard and top lights for water use. The one right next to it on the top row is for the windshield wipers. The T looking handle is for the hand throttle and that's for water use. Choke is right next to it. At the bottom of the dash, there are three controls and they are all for the heater. Electric clock, billage pump is the one at the top there. The one right below it, I have no idea what that does. It's not in the diagram that I'm getting all of these button switches and knobs from. Speedometer in center with odometer inside of it. That light that sits in between these two gauge pods, that is for the transmission control light. Last gauge has a lot going on in it. Gasoline gauge at the top. Coolant temperature gauge at the bottom. And notice it's like in the form of idiot lights. There are also four idiot lights in this gauge starting at the right and going clockwise. Ignition, main beam, turn signal. Notice there's only one turn signal indicator light and it only blinks whenever your left or right turn signal is on. Oil pressure, headlights, ignition switch, lighter, ashtray. Here is the diagram if you missed anything. Up above, sun visors, as well as here's a lever for the convertible top. Rear view mirror, notice how small and petite that rear view mirror is. Another sun visor. This one has a courtesy mirror inside as well as another latch for the convertible top. This is what I look like behind the wheel. I got tons of headroom in this car. And even if I didn't, you could take the convertible top off and you'd have all the room that you'd ever want. This, it's actually really comfortable in this car and it's not as small as I thought it would be. I always thought that these things were really small, but there's more space in this than there was in a Volkswagen Carmen Ghia for me. You sit up a little bit higher than I would think, um, but it's actually really nice. On to the glove box test. Here's our test subject. Here's my hand for reference. Here is our glove box in question. Oh man, look at that. Th that glove box is absolutely huge. There's enough space to probably put another one over there. And it shuts, no problem at all. Getting in the back seat. That's how much space you would have to get back there. I'm not gonna get back there because I don't think I'm gonna fit. Look at how much higher the back seat is in reference to anything else. Like that is where the seat cushion ends. That's where the seat top is. It's not a whole lot of space. And plus the top's on. But I did wanna show how this window worked. Look at that. That's so cool. So that's what it looks like with all the windows down. Notice how close those wheels are. Very short wheelbase. So interesting thing. So if you wanted to get underneath the hood, you pop these up and there's a special key that you turn inside here this isn't currently locked, so you just pull up on it. And it does have another latch right there. So this is what's underneath the hood section. Coming back to the under the hood section, getting into this hood, lifts up like this. And there's a little arm that catches, and there it is. There is the engine, and it's tiny. Look at my, there's my hand for reference. Half of it's exposed out here, the other half sits just behind here. It almost looks like an Austin four cylinder generator. 
is almost as big as the engine itself. Look at how they have the radiator positioned. It's up at an angle. The battery down inside here. On to the pros and cons. We are getting all of these pros and cons from the complete book of collectible cars, Blue Chip Auto Investments, 70 years from 1930 to 2000 by Richard M. Langworth and the auto editors of Consumer Guide. On the positive side, absolutely unique engine parts readily available, perfect for antique boat meets and drive-in pool parties. Against it, underpowered and cramped as a car. I think that there was more, there was a lot of space in the front. It felt more comfortable than a Volkswagen Beetle. I didn't get in the back seat. The back seat would be very cramped, in my opinion. A serious ruster, if only it was fiberglass. Body parts in short supply. All right, now it's time for Name That Tune. First person to give me both the correct name of the band as well as song title. Both correctly, first one to do so will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section. Thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. If you'd like to get in touch with me, shoot me a comment in the comment section below or check out our Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel. If you don't have Facebook, no big deal. My email will be linked in the description. So if I catch you on, if I catch you anywhere, just know that I appreciate all of the support. And until next time, here are some scenes for our next episode. 1958 Ford Ranch Wagon. It's interesting that they made more 58 ranch wagons than they did 58 Edsels, but this is my first time ever seeing a 58 ranch wagon, and I've seen tons of 58 Edsels. That's what's next on what it's like. Tune in tomorrow for that episode, and until then, toodaloo! 150 bucks off this car. Highest grossing film ever car, Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson.